Um, welcome. Thank you all for coming. We're getting close to filling the room capacity. Um, my name is Matt Huber, and I'm a professor of geography here in the Maxwell School. I'm also the leader of the Labor Studies Working Group here on campus. Um, Labor Studies is an interdisciplinary group of faculty and students dedicated to research and activism on critical issues of labor in the 21st century. In addition to holding internal workshops and reading groups, we've put on a number of uh, major events on topics like guest worker programs, um, community and labor activism, public sector workers, academic workers, and now today the topic of excluded workers. Um, and if you're interested in being involved in the Labor Studies Group, please contact me um, as soon as possible or whenever. <laughs> I, I want to first thank, before we get into introductions, um, the Maxwell School and specifically PARC, the Program for the Advancement of Research on Conflict and Collaboration. PARC has supported our group for three years now and has been instrumental to really um, providing the resources and support to put on these types of big events. So um, I want to specifically thank, um, they're not here now, but uh, Liz Myers and Deborah O'Toole who have had an incredible attention to detail. They're staff people in PARC and been really useful and helpful in putting this event on. I also want to announce um, after this panel concludes, uh, the first of two panels at 2.30, there will be coffee available. Unfortunately, logistically, we have to have the coffee up in the park office, which is on the fourth floor. So if, you want, if you're really itching for your caffeine fix after this panel, just head to the elevators and take it up to the fourth floor. I also uh, wanted to thank Gretchen Purser from Sociology. She's also not here. She's on leave this year. But um, it's really been her enthusiasm that has been such a central part of this labor studies group. And in fact, this specific event was very much inspired by a lot of conversations I had with her. Um, and the final thank you, and that's the last one, I promise, is actually goes to the United Workers Congress. This is an organization that, in their words, quote, brings together sectors of workers who were told they couldn't organize, but who went out and did it anyway. The workers they focus on are the ones we are going to talk about today, which are excluded workers. These are workers like domestic workers and farm workers who, even at the height of the American labor movement's legislative triumphs in the 1930s, were systematically excluded from some of the most basic labor rights that most workers today take for granted. Minimum wage laws, overtime pay, the right to organize and collectively bargain with employees, employers. Today, many of these workers are also immigrants. Thus, not only are they, are they excluded from legal labor rights, but they also live in fear of immigration law and enforcement. Many of these workers suffer horrendously long um, uh, working hours, unsafe conditions, and bodily and emotional abuse. Uh, since this is a legalized form of exclusion, it produces specific organizing challenges for these workforces. Um, but the thrust of today's event is formed out of the belief that these workers can organize and actually are organizing with some significant victories, but a lot of still remaining challenges. Um, so instead of the, the event, instead of completely focusing on exclusion, which has negative connotations, the United Workers Congress focuses on unity between sectors of workers. And their tagline for the organization on their website is from exclusion to power. And that, you may have noticed, is the title of the event today. And I actually contacted them, and they gave me permission to use their tagline. Um, so I wanted to give them a shout out and encourage you to visit the United Workers Congress website and get involved with the incredible work they're doing to organize these types of workers. Um, so today we have two panels. Um, the first is going to be on domestic workers, and the second, which starts at three, will be on migrant farm workers. Um, the first category of domestic workers, these are workers who, care, who work in people's homes to take care of their children, to clean, to cook, in general to take care of the most important aspects of people's lives. Yet because domestic workers were excluded from the National Labor Relations Act, 1935 and the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1937, they're often excluded from some of the most basic labor rights. They often work 12 to 14 hours a day. Indeed, sometimes they work what you could call 24 hours a day because they live in the place of employment and they're forced to be kind of on call even when they're sleeping and so forth. They're not paid minimum wages. They're subjected to physical abuse. Um, they're also subjected to 
kind of the emotional toil of loving and caring, developing loving and caring relationships with children, and then sometimes having to have those relations sort of abruptly severed through um, firings or other disputes with employers. It also should be brought up that they are predominantly women who do this work, and that this topic of domestic workers really brings to light the issues of gender and power asymmetries in our economy and, and really calls for the importance of a kind of feminist analysis of labor studies that we need to be talking about today. So our three panelists for this uh, domestic worker panel, our first is Pramila Nadison. Dr. Nadison got her PhD in history from Columbia and is now a visiting associate professor of history at Barnard College. She's one of the leading historical and feminist scholars on labor organizing amongst poor women of color, especially with regard to these forms of care work that we'll be talking about today, sort of work that involves caring for people's homes, for people's children. Uh, her first book, Welfare Warriors, um, chronicled the lives of women on welfare who were organized for the right to be supported for their actual work as mothers. And now she's working on a book-length project on post-war organizing efforts amongst domestic workers. Um, next, we have Barbara Young. Barbara is the national organizer um, for the National Domestic Worker Alliance, based in New York City, but with offices throughout the United States. Barbara moved to the US from Barbados in 1993 and has worked for several years as a domestic worker before she began to mobilize and organize around critical issues of fair labor rights for these uh, workforces. And her organizing efforts over the last 13 years, much of which took place in very ordinary spaces like playgrounds where these workers would come to meet each other and where they're taking care of children and so forth. Her organizing has been seen as absolutely central in the expansion of a kind of national and global movement for domestic workers' rights. She was a key force behind the recent passing of the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights in New York State, which passed in 2010. And last fall, California passed its own version of this law. In 2013, Barbara was awarded the Purpose uh, Prize for people who um, use positions in their career to develop their passions and expertise towards developing uh, towards public and social betterment. So we're really thrilled to have Barbara with us today. Finally, we have Kate Griffith. And Dr. Griffith got her P, or J, JD from NYU and is now an associate professor of labor and employment law at Cornell University. She is also an active member of the Precarious Workers Research Network at Cornell, um, which is based in the Worker Institute, which is part of Cornell's School of Industrial and Labor Relations. A lot of labor stuff happening at Cornell, which our group is trying to link into as well. Um, her expertise focuses on the intersection of labor law and immigration law. A lot of the workers we're talking about today are um, unauthorized or undocumented immigrants, so this is a really crucial intersection, legally speaking. Um, given that the issue of uh, excluded workers is ultimately about law and legal regimes, uh, labor law, um, and given that many of these workers are immigrants, we thought Dr. Griffith's expertise would help us understand the lar larger legal challenges for these workers and understand how the different categories of workers can link up together to organize to enact broader legal changes to these forms of exclusion that affect them both. In 2010, Dr. Griffith received a Cornell um, ILR McIntyre Award for exemplary teaching and was uh, selected by a Merrill Presidential Scholar as the faculty member who has had the most positive influence on education at um, Cornell University. So it's very prestigious. Um, so those the, the panelists will go in the order I just introduced them. And now I can finally shut up and turn it over to Pramila. Thank you. Great. Um, I just want to say thank you to Matt uh, for inviting me to Syracuse in the middle of winter. <laughs> I'm sure this couldn't be held in the summertime. Uh, anyway, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to be on the panel with Kate and with Barbara. Um, 
I just want to say a little bit, I also got the short straw, I guess, when this panel was um, decided because I'm the academic, I guess, okay. the representative academic. Well, Kate's an academic, too. But I think both Kate and I have multiple identities, <laughs> and activism is very much a part of our identities. Um, I first became involved in domestic worker organizing as a supporter of Domestic Workers United in the late 1990s. Um, so I witnessed and I participated in some of the very early struggles. Um, and that deeply impressed me and has informed my scholarship and my writing to a great degree. So I want to talk today uh, a little bit about why I think this organizing is so, is so important why it's such a powerful example um, of a new kind of labor organizing that I think offers us some food for thought about the future of labor. And there are three main issues that I want to discuss. One is I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the marginalization of domestic work by the labor movement, both practically as well as conceptually. I want to talk about the history of domestic worker organizing and then I want to address what lessons domestic worker organizing can offer labor organizers today. So first on the marginalization of domestic work. Uh, for most of our history, private household labor, the nannies, care workers, uh, maids, have been on the margins of what we think of as labor and outside the boundaries of what the labor movement has considered its core constituency. So labor leaders have never really tried to organize domestic workers in any kind of serious way. Uh, and the very notion of work and worker that most labor activists have utilized has excluded household workers. And the reasons for this are fairly clear. One is that this is work that takes place in the ostensibly private space of the home, a geographical location uh, that really since the emergence of modern capitalism was considered the antithesis of the site of work and in fact was considered a refuge from the harsh, competitive, from the harsh competitiveness of the marketplace. In addition, the work that domestics engaged in was and is associated with women's unpaid social re reproductive labor in the home. So it was considered by some a labor of love and therefore not real work. And this notion has often applied to domestics who uh, employers sometimes labeled one of the family, which enabled them to extract more work from their employees on the presumed basis of familial status. And this is a status that domestic workers have flatly rejected. Domestic work was also difficult to organize because unlike in large industry, there were multiple employers, usually each with a single employee, which made things like strikes uh, and other kinds of collective pressure very difficult. So labor leaders often struggled with how to identify, how to reach out to, and how to mobilize household workers. In addition, this was a workforce that was largely poor women of color, many of whom were immigrants. Uh, and in the South, um, the vast majority of domestic workers were African American women. And after World War I, this was true in the North as well. So the historically gendered and racialized notions of work pushed this category outside the purview of the union movement. Um, in fact, the union movement really emerged out of a commitment to um, protect the privilege uh, of organized white male skilled workers in the 19th century, uh, sometimes even to the point of opposing the inclusion of women or people of color into union ranks. There were, of course, much more radical alternatives at this moment, and I'm thinking in particular of the, of the International Workers of the World or the Knights of Labor. And there were also other kinds of grassroots labor resistance. So, so part of what I'm distinct, distinguishing here is between what we might call the union movement on the one hand and the labor movement, which was much more diverse and expansive on the other hand. The very definition of what constitutes work 
and a worker were reinscribed and institutionalized during the New Deal. The New Deal reforms, while good for many workers, really reified the male manufacturing model as a prototypical worker. This, this legislation created a hierarchy um, within the labor force through its exclusions as well as its provisions. This was both because of Southern congressmen who refused to grant any kinds of labor rights to the largely African-American Southern labor force, as well as influence and pressure by the American Federation of Labor, uh, which was committed, again, not to a broad labor movement, but really to its primarily male uh, constituency. So domestic workers, uh, as well as many other occupations that were dominated by women and people of color, were excluded from provisions such as, the social, such as the Social Security Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and the National Labor Relations Act, uh, which gave domestic workers the right to organize and bargain collectively, and from which domestic workers are still excluded today. So New Deal legislation drew a clear line between those workers who were protected by labor law and those who were not, establishing legal distinctions among workers. So domestic workers, both in terms of the labor movement as well as in social policy, uh, have been outside the boundaries of what constitutes legitimate labor. Despite the widespread view that domestic workers could not be organized uh, and that this was not real work, there has been a very long history of collective organizing by domestic workers. Tara Hunter, uh, a historian at Princeton, has written about domestic worker organizing in the 1880s, and she writes about uh, African-American washerwomen, these were laundry workers, who formed something called a washing society. Um, in Atlanta, and they organized a citywide strike uh, for higher wages and basically shut the city down. In the early 20th century, at the height of labor militancy, uh, there were a number of, uh, number of organizations that were formed. The Laundry Workers International Union was formed in 1900. It eventually became affiliated with the American Federation of Labor in 1909. There was a Domestic Workers Industrial Union in Denver, headed by Jane Street, that was affiliated with the International Workers of the World, and both of these were white immigrant uh, formations. There was also a colored domestic union of New Orleans that was headed by a woman named Ella Pete, uh, uh, and that in 1918 had about 300 members. And then again during the Great Depression, and this was a moment when the employment situation was so dire that African American women were forced to stand on street corners waiting for day work. Um, the equivalent of the day laborers today. Uh, it, uh, it was a pattern that two uh, journalists called the quote unquote slave markets uh, because of the way in which they were exploited by employers. So in this context, we see another round of organizing by domestic workers uh, in New York City, in Newark, in San Diego, in Chicago. Just to give you one example, in New York City, uh, a woman named Dora Jones in 1934 organized uh, a group called Demet the Domestic Workers Union which had about a 1,000 members uh, and became affiliated with the Building Service Employees International Union. And then in the 1960s and 1970s, African-American women um, who were domestic workers, uh, people like Dorothy Bolden in Atlanta, Geraldine Roberts in Cleveland, and Mary McClendon in Detroit organized domestic worker rights groups that came together primarily with the assistance not of the labor movement, but of civil rights organizations and women's organizations. And they formed the Household Technicians of America in 1972, which had a nationwide membership of about 25,000, which was actually pretty close to where Students for a Democratic Society was. The HTA had a broad-based agenda that included things like higher wages, better working conditions, job training and professionalization. And it was that organization that was instrumental in the passage of the 1974 amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act that finally brought most domestic workers minimum wage protections for the first time. 
Over the past 20 years, uh, there's been another upsurge of domestic worker organizing, led largely by immigrant women of color, often undocumented, uh, who came from all parts of the world, from the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Jamaica, Nepal, Mexico, El Salvador, Brazil, Nigeria. And they have established support networks, um, started training programs, raised public awareness, and pushed for legislative reform. Most domestic workers in this more recent round of, uh, of organizing have, have, have come together in ethnic networks or in community-based associations. And race, culture, and ethnicity are very much a part of their organizing strategy. They have made public or neighborhood spaces rather than the shop floor, the primary site of organizing. And so this includes things like public parks or city buses. Uh, they've established worker centers. Um, and they think of labor organizing much more as community-based rather than as workplace-based. They've used shaming strategies to expose particularly abusive employers and shed light on the most exploitative aspects of the occupation. And they've relied on legislative strategies such as a Bill of Rights campaign uh, that's been passed in New York, Hawaii, and California to offer broad-based protections for workers rather than specific employer-based benefits. Hundreds of groups have formed around the U.S., and they've also formed local, regional, national, as well as international alliances. And Barbara, I think, is going to talk a bit more about some of the specific campaigns. So I want to just conclude with why I think this work is so important. Uh, domestic worker organizing has been one of the most promising sites of worker mobilizations. They've offered innovative strategies in part because of the historic exclusions from the rights and privileges of labor, much like other kinds of excluded workers. So domestic workers are rethinking the meaning of labor uh, through their organizing and their demands. They have argued that the work that takes place in the privacy of the home, the labor of social reproduction, uh, is work that needs to be compensated and recognized, the same as other kinds of labor. This revaluing of domestic labor broadens the way we think about work. And I think it really brings into focus an analysis of gender in thinking about how we define labor. Second is the relationship between citizenship rights and labor rights. Since many domestic workers are undocumented, this movement fights rather deliberately for labor rights regardless of status, transcending the boundary between citizen, non-citizen, and undocumented. So membership is not limited to those with legal status. It is largely women of color who are the agents of change for domestic work. And these women of color who come from all parts of the world bring their transnational experience with them, uh, which has helped forge, uh, not everywhere, but in, but in many locations, a transnational feminist vision for labor organizing. They offer a feminist critique of the lack of value placed on care work and, ha and have established a model of labor organizing that takes into account the personal needs of women, uh, whether that includes child care or even just serving dinner at a meeting. They have also formed cross-racial, cross-ethnic alliances and have managed to work together on specific campaigns, even while maintaining uh, a sense of cultural difference. For domestic workers, I think this happened in part because of the isolation and the marginalization of the workforce and the profound sense uh, of the need to work collectively. This organizing uh, is significant, I think, because their models of organizing don't apply only to domestic workers, but they really represent an emerging sector of American labor. Uh, in a context of neoliberalism, when the welfare state has been dismantled, when public sector unions are under attack, when the rights of labor are rapidly shrinking, 
uh, and, and, and the manufacturing sector has declined. There has been a corresponding increase in informal, precarious, part-time contract and temporary labor. So workers today are more likely to be employed in the surface sector, are more likely to be undocumented, highly mobile, women of color, and not necessarily tied to a single employer. So in short, they are much more likely to work under circumstances that are comparable to those of domestic work. And this can help us think about whether the workplace or the community should be the focus of organizing, whether the goal should be employer protections versus state-based protections. So domestic work, like other examples of what some scholars have called social movement unionism, such as justice for janitors, day laborers, restaurant workers, and farm workers, are offering an example of those who have historically been excluded from labor protections, um, are offering an example of how we can begin to move forward with new definitions of the critical issues confronting workers and new definitions of what constitutes work. Thank you. Thank you, Pramila. Next, we have Barbara Young. I'm going to try to get the computer working again. There we go. I think I know the password. It's always this thing. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Pamela, for um, touching on um, this uh, subject. And um, and um, you speak about the domestic workers very eloquently. I'm Barbara Young, as uh, Matt introduced me. And um, I, myself, was a domestic worker. I'm now today an organizer with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, but um, I immigrated here from Barbados, and it was a change, a big change for me, because in Barbados I was a bus conductor. I was a part of the union movement, the Barbados Labor Union, and I had benefits, and I represent workers for bus drivers, conductors for any infractions that they committed before the, the management of um, the company. But coming to the U.S., first I should say the reason I, I came to the U.S. like most immigrant is to find work. And this is supposed to be the place of opportunity. And. Um, I lost my job when um, the country went through some hard hardship and, um, and the economic downturn back in the late 80s. And um, like people say, when America catch a coal, everyone sneeze. Mm -hmm. So that was that period for us. And um, the then prime minister, the co my country, he approached the IMF and the World Bank for um, support, economic support, and they, one of the measures that they put in place was they got, we had to cut back on goods and services. So our buses was two persons operated buses. There was a bus driver and there was me with my bag collecting the money and the fares and totaling the receipts at the end of the day, paying it in. And then cutting back on goods and services meant taking all the conductors off the buses, importing some fare boxes, and turning the buses into one person operated buses. And so myself and 942 other conductors lost their jobs because of this measure. And this is the reason that I end up here in the US, which was, as I thought, I was coming to something much better. And arriving in New York, I, find, I started looking for a job. I found a job as a caregiver for um, the elderly, two elderly 
people. And when that job finished, it transferred then into me going to an agency and getting a job as a nanny. And that job with my first nanny job lasted for seven years with that one family. One child to begin with, four years after they had a second child. And I stayed with that job for those seven years. And it wasn't at the time that I knew, it, I would say it wasn't a bad job, but it was long hours and low pay. And, but I, the most, I would say, that kept me on that job was the love that I had for those two children. And the love that the, those two children had for me as a caregiver. And it really broke my heart when I was going to leave that job. I just was tired of living in situation and could only go home on the weekend. And I, I just said to them, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to go back to my country and we're going to spend a, a little time. And then I, when I come back, I'm going to find a, a live out job. And so I did. But it was hard for me. It was hard for the children. And the little boy who I started with, I remember when I tell him that I was leaving the job, it was so emotional. Um, he just, Barbara, what's going to happen to Katie? Who's going to look after her? And this, he was only eight, but his sister was four, and he was thinking so much of her and what was going to happen to her. Um, I did, went home, and I spent two months, and then I came back to the U.S. Went to an agency, find a job. Um, the agency sent me to a job with a five-week-old baby. And in sitting down in the playground with this little child downtown and the, in Manhattan, and this is how I got involved in organizing work. I'm sitting in the playground with a little baby and this lady approached me and she said, um, I am from Domestic Workers United and um, we're doing a training. I said, I don't need a training. <laughs> I, uh, I'm already experienced in this work. And, and she said to me, well, um, you can come join the organization. If you were a nurse, you would join the Nurses Association. And with this course, it is a certificate course, and you'll get a certificate from Hunter College, and you will also get a CPR training from the American Heart Association. And that sparked my interest, because I wanted to be trained in CPR. I went to the organization, and when the course came up, I did the course. And realized that it was not only a skills building course, because there was a pediatrician that came in to lecture us in that. There were people from occupational safety and health that came in to lecture us. There was the American Heart Association that came in and lecture us. And then the course took a different turn um, and talk, started talking about the politics of the organization. The politics that have domestic workers and the domestic work industry the way it was, and talking about the exclusions from the labor laws, from the Fair Labor Standard Act, and then again in the 70s from the National Labor Relations Act, which again excluded domestic workers and farm laborers. And then the conversation switched to what were we going to, if, are we going to remain a victim? Are we going to remain victims in, this jo in these jobs? Because people were telling their stories, or what were we going to do about it? And um, the conversation went to, to Rosa Parks and the, play, the part that she played in changing laws in the U.S.
how she sat on the bus and refused to get up, and because of that, the laws in um, Montgomery County changed um, two years after. And so we just decided, look, we're going to try to change laws if from one of exclusion to one of inclusion. And this was the start of the domestic worker organizing to change the laws that had hindered many workers from so many years. And so I signed up right away. I'm a full-time nanny, and I just signed up to be a volunteer at Domestic Workers United. Because this course that I was hearing about, that I was taking part in, I wanted every nanny in New York to know about their rights as a domestic worker, to feel good about the jobs they were doing, and to come together and organize for better working conditions. One lady came forward and tell her story. She was working in, in the suburbs in the Hamptons, and she broke her, her foot on her job, and because of it, her employer said to her she could have let her die in the basement because nobody knew she was there. And what happened at that time, we were very, very upset over what happened. And we organized, agitate. We went all the way to the Hamptons to the employer's um, place of business. She operated a, a restaurant. And with a, a, a busload of workers and uh, supporters. And a Saturday afternoon in the summer, we were in the Hamptons just chanting and walking on the sidewalks. And finally, we got her to, to pay the, her worker that she had not paid because she said she was leaving and she couldn't work with a broken ankle. And we came back and decided, let us do something about this. So we went to the city council in New York. And with the help of um, law students from NYU Law School, they helped us put our thoughts and our words together in legal terms. We went to city council and got them to sign the first bill that make agencies who send workers out to work responsible. And this was in 2003. This was the first piece of law that we tried to, to change in support of the domestic workers. And after that successful effort, we decided then to mobilize more workers together. And let us try to see, because our members, many of our members, are undocumented. And we have to work through labor and through legisla the legislature to see if laws can be set to govern this industry, because the laws at the federal level doesn't really protect the domestic workers. We got together with many groups, and we, f we had a convention, which was the beginning of this. 250 women come, came together. And this, I would say, was the start of a domestic workers' bill, because the workers came together, and the question was, what can you do? What can we do? to make our, law, our jobs better. What would we like to see in the industry? And there was a lot of uh, support. And we put it all, to, we put this together again. We, with the help of the Urban Justice Center, and um, we formulate a bill and took to to Albany, 
we wanted to, to correct what was left undone by the National Labor Relations Act that had excluded domestic workers. The bill that we took, the Bill of Rights that we took to Albany, it was, it took many years because it was a, a, a the process was so long that we had to start by explaining to the legislator what was a domestic worker when we got there. To them, when we talk about domestic workers, I, the term wasn't um, very familiar to them, and they were mistakenly thinking domestic violence, which takes place sometimes, but in the industry, but it was the domestic workers who work in other people's home that um, we were seeking to get laws to help. And we had to, we came back from there, from the, the first initial start of this bill with the resolve that we were we were going to change tactics. If the small initial start was 10 people in a 15-seater van coming to Albany, we need to look at the power in Albany and what little power we had and how we could escalate and build on, the, on our power. And the, the bill that we, we, we had we try to, to frame it, the bill with a very broad message that could resonate with multiple sectors. First, respect the work that makes all other work possible, because that's how we saw the domestic work. Uh, if you are a professional in any, and want to have a profession and a family, you can be sure there's a domestic worker there assisting you. The other part of the message was reserve, re, reverse the long legacy of discriminations and exclusions in the labor law. Uh, and third, we needed standards that would benefit everyone. If there are standards in the industry that the workers um, work by, there's also standards for the employer, and the employer knows exactly how to treat their worker, because there, now there would be a guideline if we got this bill um, passed. So the second and the third year in Albany, we came back and we decided to build a base. We had to build workers. We had to do research on the industry. We we did. Um, we got workers together. We do a tribunal. We did rallies. Then we had Albany days. We had town halls. We had children vigils. Workers of children that came out to, um, vigils. And we went to to the churches. And we did what we call domestic workers in the pulpit. And this was for domestic workers who are living in um, their employer's home, only come out on the weekends, and but uh, because of the, what they brought to the country with them, they had to go to church on a Sunday. So we went to the churches to reach the domestic workers that would not otherwise have heard about the movement and, and the work that was going on. And so we went uh, to the churches and we carried leaflets and flyers and we talked about the domestic workers and the, work, the people, workers who were involved in the church uh, as, com as part of the movement to join the movement of domestic workers. Also, we outreach to the labor unions. The labor unions always see domestic workers as a group of workers that were unorganizable. They couldn't organize because of the scattered nature of the domestic workers. And we reach out to them for support. 
We reach out to other grassroots organizations. We reach out to the synagogues, and we got the, the Jewish folks involved because a lot of the Jewish people were employers of domestic workers. And no doubt was very happy with the workers that they hire. So we got them involved. We reach out to the colleges that worked with us before. We, we, reach out, we reach out to a broad, we build a broad coalition that we could take to Albany. The fifth and the sixth year that we were in Albany, because it, it kept going on and um, we couldn't get the bill passed, and we decided we're not going to give up. We're going to continue um, to get this bill. The fifth year in Albany, it was what they call a coup in Albany, a power struggle among the legislators in Albany. And we thought that that, that year, that, that was the year. Every year it was, this is going to be the year for us. <laughs> this is going to be the year for us. And that um, fifth year, um, we went to a radio station to to talk about the domestic workers bill that was in Albany. And on the phone, on a segment of that um, learner show, was the governor of New York at the time. And when we were physically in the this, in this studio, but he was on the phone with another segment. And when that segment finished, um, he was asked, uh, Governor, there is a, I have some women here, and there's a domestic workers' bill that is tied up in Albany. Um, and the governor says, oh, I know about it. I know about it. If they could get it to my desk, I would sign it into law. And this was the first time that we knew where the governor stood on this domestic workers' bill. And the very next year, the sixth year, we got the bill through both houses of the legislature, and the governor signed it into law. But it was a, a hard time for us, and um, we had to use a lot of different um, tactics, a lot of different strategies we use, mostly stories of workers, stories of employers, the stories of children. Um, we use the principle of trust, trust in each other, trust in, um, in creating a space for all our coalition partners. And one of the biggest things I think that we learned was to count our victories, no matter how small. Because some people then said, oh, we didn't get everything that we had asked for in that bill. <clears throat> but we did get a bill, to, uh, the first bill in this country, to protect domestic workers. And this was historic. This was the first bill in New York, and um, we didn't want it to be just a flagship or something that New York did. So we start to look at California, and California has since passed a domestic workers bill. The first year that it was passed, it was vetoed by the then governor. The next year, that the bill went back, it was passed, and he signed it into law. So now we have a domestic workers' bill in New York, in California. Um, this, uh, the senator in Hawaii was so impressed when she heard the work that we were doing, she went back to Hawaii and she introduced a domestic workers' bill in Hawaii, which her colleagues passed. So there is a domestic workers bill in Hawaii. And at present, there is a domestic workers bill going through the legislatures of Massachusetts. And we're hoping to pass that bill. Um, if we don't get it through this year, we're going, hoping to get it passed next year. And then there's Seattle, Washington, and Maryland um, in um, DC to introduce their bills next. And there has been a constant 
winning segment for us as organizing um, and domestic workers, um, not only here in the U.S., but um, through the AFL partnership with the AFL-CIO, we had a seat at the International Labor Organization, and they passed a convention of decent work for domestic workers. And this include domestic workers from all around the world, and we, were hap we happened to be at that table. And with the, I'm going to, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the, uh, because of our members, <laughs> uh, I've seen you. <laughs> uh, because of our because our members are mostly immigrant women, the um, immigration bill in DC is affecting a lot of our workers. Um, people just want um, to be able to work freely, to be to travel back and forth, and we have a campaign called "We Belong Together." Um, immigration campaign, which um, we started because of the deportation of a lot of women uh, leaving their children behind, having to leave their children, U.S.-born citizen children behind, and um, being deported. And this was a very depressing situation for us. And so we launched this campaign called We Belong Together. And then, because a lot of our workers are in the care work, um, we have a campaign, Caring Across Generation, which we partner with over 200 organizations um, to, to bring, create jobs in the care industry because so many of, um, so many people are aging at such a rapid rate in this country. And since 2011, RVA second, some person turns 65. And if we look at 20 years down the line, we'd be a nation of 85 year olds and needing a little help. And most people want to remain in their homes. I'm very sorry, but I wanted to show a little bit clip, but um, time has run out. Um, but the clip was just about how we bring workers together from different countries, different nations, and to speak the same language and how they're joining forces with the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Thank you. So it looks like none of us are taking advantage of the technology. I, too, will just be speaking <laughs> without any, uh, any videos or anything. So first, I wanted to thank Matt and everyone else who was involved in making today happen. This is a really wonderful event. And as Matt mentioned, the Cornell's Worker Institute is just getting underway. And we're really looking forward to finding ways to collaborate uh, with this group. It's also a real honor to be sitting on this panel with two amazing people, Barbara and Pramila. And what you're going to hear from me, some of you've already heard a little bit from, from them. But since I'm the law person um, and I was asked to kind of give the broader legal context, I thought I'd talk to you about sort of two legal stories that we see with respect to domestic workers. And the first you've heard, it's really a story of exclusion from labor and employment rights. But as I'll talk about, sometimes the focus on legal exclusions can overlook a couple of important things. Um, one, domestic workers do have some rights. So yes, they're excluded. They're really important exclusions, and I'll, I'll go into detail about them. But they still do have rights. And, and that's important. It's important on a number of levels, and certainly organizers have told me you know, when people don't think they have rights, that can work against their, their organizing efforts. And, and it's just, as a factual matter, incorrect. Also, domestic workers, as you've heard already, have successfully organized despite, despite these major exclusions. And sometimes uh, they've used the law as a tactic in that organizing. So that's sort of the first story, the exclusion story. The second legal story is the story about uh, how, especially undocumented immigrants who do domestic work, run into this conflict between our labor and employment rights regime and our immigration restrictions. And, and I'll go into that as sort of the second story. 
So first with exclusions, and some of this you've heard, um, but really the New Deal period exclusions are the ones that most people are talking about when they talk about exclusions from labor and employment rights. And the National Labor Relations Act is the big one. It writes out farm workers are not included and, and domestic workers as well. And many of you probably know what this means and, and, and what the National Labor Relations Act is, but in case there are a couple of people who really don't have much exposure to labor law, what this means for domestic workers who are organizing to be excluded from a national labor rights, what this means is if an employer sees that domestic worker talking to a union or thinks that that domestic worker likes unions or might like unions or has thought about unions in the past, they can fire them for that. They can take any adverse employment action against them and there's no legal recourse. Um, so it doesn't even have to be actual union membership. It's just a perception that that person might be someone who, who likes collective activity. So that's important. Uh, the other is even when domestic workers are successful and gain a majority of support uh, from, from workers and they're organizing, employers don't have any duty to bargain with them about their working conditions uh, because of this exclusion. So that's the National Labor Relations Act exclusion, the labor law exclusion. The other big one which you've heard about is the Fair Labor Standards Act. That's the, the federal wage standard. And they were, um, the domestic workers were written out of that as well. It was changed in the 70s, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So both of these exclusions during the New Deal period, during the 30s, were seen as essential to get the legislation passed. Southern uh, Democrats would not sign on to either pieces of legislation without these exclusions. Um, so it's sort of a political uh, reason behind it, uh, but it has, of course, long-lasting effects. And as Pramila already talked about, uh, scholars have also looked into and, and talked about how you know women's work is not seen as real work, and there are other reasons. Uh, it happens in private space. Should the government really be involved in, uh, in regulating that area? But in terms of the, the political decision to get it passed, uh, it's simply the, legis the Demo Southern Democrats would not sign on. The other major exclusion, and, and mostly I'm talking so far about federal law, although state laws are, are largely similar here, but the other major exclusion happens uh, during the, the civil rights era, the, our other major labor and employment law moment uh, starting in the 60s. So Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which restricts employers' ability to discriminate based on certain categories like race and gender, religion, et cetera. And then, of course, there are others that are added later, age discrimination. Domestic workers are not covered by any of these laws. Um, they're excluded. They're not written out, but the laws have minimum employees. Uh, they only cover uh, workplaces with employ with that have more than 15 employees or more than 20 employees. So domestic workers usually are not working in households of 20 employees or 15 employees. So they just simply don't have federal protections against sexual uh, harassment in the workplace or uh, discrimination based on race. It's a major exclusion, sometimes gets overlooked by the focus on labor and wage uh, exclusions. The other exclusion is the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Domestic workers are just written out of that one, too. Uh, for And the government's rationale was policy reasons. You know, are we really going to go in and inspect someone's home to see if they have toxic cleaning materials? For policy reasons, we're going to just exclude that group. So major, major exclusion. So as you can see, it is an exclusion story. But uh, there are important inclusions in the law. And one I've made reference to already is the Fair Labor Standards Act Amendment in 1974. So. In 1974, Congress changes our wage laws and says, all right, well, domestic workers do have rights to minimum wage and overtime, but not live-ins. Live-in uh, live uh, domestic workers don't have the right to overtime. They, can, they get minimum wage as a federal law matter, but not overtime. Now, this you, you can see here some of the important state-level efforts that uh, that Barbara was talking about to sort of fix some of these things. Uh, the, the New York Domestic Worker Bill of Rights um, added overtime uh, for live-ins after 44 hours of work each week. So they're sort of 
fixing some of the um, remaining exclusions in the wage laws. Also, uh, they, the uh, Domestic Worker Bill of Rights in New York fixes this discrimination exclusion that I talked to you before. And even though New York's protections for um, sex discrimination, race discrimination had a four employee uh, limit, the, the new law says uh, domestic workers are included, even if they're in a workplace or in a home that has less than four employees. So that's a very important state level fix. It's very rare though, right? I mean, hopefully it's growing, but New York is very much the outlier here. Most states, uh, domestic workers in most states don't have any employment discrimination protections at all. So far, uh, the National Labor Relations Act has not been amended uh, in many ways, uh, but it has not changed this exclusion for domestic workers. And at the state level, we really haven't seen yet um, much success uh, to include uh, protections for domestic worker organizing, although great efforts have been made and um, New York is moving in that direction, but they have not actually uh, passed any protections. So that's still a major exclusion. Now, uh, a couple of other Fed uh, state level inclusions, workers' compensation in New York and some other states, domestic workers who work over 40 hours a week have inclusion in these protections on employment insurance, uh, but this really will vary from state to state. Okay, so that's kind of the exclusion inclusion story. I, you know, as a lawyer, I would love to give you more detail, but I know <laughs> You probably don't want it, uh, but in question and answer, if you wanted, you know, sort of talk about some of the, the differences and in, uh, in the law, we we can talk about that. Uh, so the other story, the other legal story here, is this intersection between immigration and labor and employment rights. Historically, immigration law and labor and employment law have been just totally separate statutory regimes that don't affect each other. So if somebody um, is seen by immigration law as a legal permanent resident or you know whatever their category is, authorized, unauthorized, had no effect at all on whether they should be paid wages under our Fair Labor Standards Act or whether they have the right to organize under labor law. They were just separate things. Employees get labor and employment rights. If you fit that definition, you get them. And immigration law is a separate matter. In the 1980s, uh, specifically in 1986, Congress changed the way that uh, we enforce immigration. And, and it did it in a number of ways. Um, the legal, major legalization program is kind of what people think about in that uh, co last comprehensive immigration reform. But the other thing it did that's, that's really important here is that it targeted the workplace as a place to uh, implement immigration restrictions. So before that, it was really border enforcement. It was major, this sort of major, and a little bit of interior enforcement, but not much. But the thought was, well, people are really coming unauthorized to get jobs, so let's make the jobs harder to get. How should we do it? One, employers need to verify the immigration status of their employees. Before 1986, they did not have that obligation. So and those of you who have worked in the formal sector, you've filled out an I-9, hopefully, and that, that's, that's an 86 change. It also, the law also sanctioned employers who hire uh, knowingly undocumented immigrants. So what this did is it led some uh, innovative lawyers to start arguing that that change in immigration law means that unauthorized workers don't have the same protections under labor and employment uh, rights. And uh, in 2002, a major Supreme Court case uh, bought onto that argument a little bit, uh, and it's sort of created a cascade of litigation about the rights of undocumented immigrants. So even when they're included um, in labor and employment rights, which I just talked about, there's, if they're undocumented, sometimes there, there's a question about how, main, how much how far that protection goes. Uh, in this major Supreme Court case, some of you may have heard of it, it's called Hoffman Plastic Compounds. There, the Supreme Court said in this case where an employer had definitely fired people because they were organizing a union, these people were covered by the National Labor Relations Act. 
so it was a violation of labor law. But because uh, one of the one of the workers was not authorized under immigration law, they couldn't get um, the remedies, the legal remedy of pay of back pay. Uh, in response to that violation. So they had rights, but they, they didn't have the remedy. So that case spawned more cases and questions um, when unauthorized immigrants walk into courts and say, well, you know, I didn't get paid my overtime or I didn't get paid my minimum wage. You know, so far, it's it has had a limited effect uh, in terms of court decisions, but it's had a big effect in terms of the fear uh, that it brings uh, to uh, especially unauthorized immigrants who want to raise claims against their employers. And this is really important in the U.S. legal system and the way that, that we regulate uh, workplace rights is we don't hire lots and lots of inspectors to, to go into workplaces and find violations. What we do is we encourage workers themselves to come forward and to identify potential claims. So the more fear that undocumented immigrants have of coming forward and the potential immigration consequences, the less likely they are, of course, to come forward, even when you know there are very, very serious uh, wage abuses and other kinds of um, labor and employment rights. Of uses. Okay, so I will, I'll stop it there so we can turn uh, to questions and answers. Maybe what I'll do is if we, we still have about 25 minutes, I will show your video really quickly yeah. and then we will open it up for questions. Let's use the technology. Yes. <laughs> you can so much, you love so much. And yet, you, your work is not so seen as important yep. and it has value. Society wouldn't be able to do the work that needs to be done without us, without having someone to care for the children, uh, to clean the office, uh, to clean their homes, to give love to an elderly parent. This industry is a predominantly woman of color and immigrant woman. Para mí es muy importante el hecho de organizar trabajadoras de casa, ya que debido a las exclusiones que tienen de los derechos laborales. Somos eh, trabajadoras del hogar visibles. Antes estábamos pues en la sombra. When I first heard you coming to Boston, we had already started organizing in our organization. We are so excited and we're like, we need to meet them, to share with them what we already started here in Boston because I know we're going to get the support. I know we're going to get leadership and training from them to help us carry this movement. I needed to be a part of something much bigger. And for me, the Alliance filled that void. It's a movement that's really focused on both building strong alliances and in the process of building those ties, targeting issues that it's possible to actually win. Makes a huge difference. Winning, winning is good. <laughs> winning really is good. <laughs> We have achieved many objectives, one of them being the New York law to respect the rights of domestic workers. In New York, we won the Bill of Rights. The win in New York was tremendous because it means that an issue that, number one, nobody cared about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, very few people cared about, is on the map. I would really like to see we, as a national organization, get the right in every state. We want to build a more caring economy that works for everyone. There's about 30 seconds left. Let's see if it. Eh. Let me see if I can call it back up to the same point. Gamma.
I think it's all overdue. It couldn't be a better time than now. La Alianza es parte de mi vida, es parte de mi historia. Y mi historia es poder. This movement is unstoppable because it is built on and led by love. Okay, so now let's open it up for discussion and questions for our panelists. Yeah, okay. now, I'm curious to know, I don't know who might answer this, but uh, someone brought up an example, I think it was you, Barbara, that uh, when a woman had some grievance uh, and her employers, I think it was near the Hamptons area, yes. that you sent a busload of people to, to demonstrate at the employer's place of uh, uh, work or ownership yeah, there. Uh, but, but I'd like to know specifically, like, what would a woman do in, who's working for an employer alone in the house, for example, and has a grievance, whether it's wage or some other infraction against her rights, specifically what would a union do to protect her if she belonged to a recognized union? They, um, they recognize union as, um, you say, like one of the registered unions and not a worker center like we are. <clears throat> they, I don't think that they have um, a right, or the, uh, the rights are the privilege or the connection to go and, and do what we do. Because um, as worker centers, we agitate. We are forcing that employer to pay the worker that um, she just said, well, you know, if you're gonna go, just leave. I'm not paying you. And, and she definitely owed that. And what we, what we as worker centers do, we started with a letter to the employer to um, let them know that, sh that they should pay, she should pay this, this worker, you know, and any um, medical bills that she incurred while she was on her, her property, on, on the job. On the, on the other hand, um, since I was organizing in New York, um, <clears throat> most of the most of the going to the workplace um, of the employers I was done is done by worker center rather than mainstream unions. But mainstream unions do support us, um, although they are not physically themselves there. They do um, support the work that we we do. Yeah, if I could just add on onto that, I think I think Barbara's absolutely <coughs> right. You know, I think both because of the limited legal rights that domestic workers have to organize, um, as well as the nature of the occupation because it's so isolated, uh, the strategies they've been using, as she explained, are really about political pressure or social pressure, about shaming employers, about raising public awareness, uh, more so than having a, a grievance procedure, so to speak. Um, so, you know, and that's why I, I think I use the term social movement unionism, because I think it's more about social movement organizing that, that is under, a, you know, a rubric of labor rather than our traditional notion of labor organizing. Um, how far along are the campaigns in the D.C. and Maryland areas? They um, and this will be for me, I guess. Yeah, they, um, they, we have organizations in the, um, the DC and Maryland areas, and um, they are like our main support for actions that, we, that are held on the Hill, um, and for the legislators that are in the DC area, because we know most of them have their home offices and they scatter around the state, but they also have their DC location. So <clears throat> rather than um, flying um, a whole lot of people across the country, um, the organizations in that area do support the work that's there. But they are established organizations, and um, although not only for domestic workers, they have other segment of workers that they represent. Do you think that there's 
kind of holding back because I mean I'm I'm from that area. Most of the uh, most of those politicians you're talking about have undocumented workers. Yeah. Do you think they're stymieing the efforts on purpose because of their their undocumented workers? Uh, I I I really can't say. I really don't know. But um, I, I I think that it is. Um, an effort to to hold it back for whatever for whatever reason there is, but um, we are still forging forward to get it done. Um, next month in the D.C. area, they have um, a fast for families that they're organizing from around the country, and it's going to pass from one village to another or one state to another. Um, from people to people are going to join the fast. Whether you fast for two days here, two days there, um, let us know, and then it's going to uh, culminate with a big fast of over 5,000 people in D.C. At the, at the mall in D.C. at the end of the month. Yeah. Um, first of all, I really want to recognize um, all your work that you do with organizing. Um, I know how tough it is, and especially from your position. Um, I had a question about the intersection between the labor and immigration. Um, and I, I, I recognize that there's so many layers and complications to that, um, because I work around undocumented immigrant rights as well, but I focus on young people. Um, but I just realized while you were talking that there's this huge generational gap between um, young youth um, undocumented work organizing and the domestic and the older our parents. Um, so I wanted to ask, like, what are the proportions of undocumented domestic workers within your organization and the work that you do? Um, because it is, I think it is one thing for, for us to say that um, there is a huge proportion of undocumented workers within domestic work that is affected by it compared to who is um, sort of shaping the organizing, like how many people are actually in it. Because I see all the risk in organizing, and even as young people who do not have a lot of risk, I see that parents for parents, it's not just legal rights, but it's also their job positions as well. And because they are not even protected by um, these labor laws, like what are the proportions of representation of um, undocumented workers within the organization? And what do they offer? They, um, according to our research, there is about 80, I think it was about 85% of undocumented workers doing um, domestic work. But their level of involvement with organizing is very high. Be um, most of them are immigrants that was that is here for so many years. Some of them are here for over 20 years in this country and have um, American-born children. So um, we are we totally support the Dream Act with the young people that was brought to the country at very, a very early age, and we know the president um, he really put that ahead. And some states now are really picking it up and giving them you know um, support for their education, educational support. So the the undocumented. Um, people, um, women, mostly, I would say that are here, their involvement is, is high. And we, as an organization, decide early on with this immigration debate to, put, to try to put the voices of women into the debate. Because it started with, what, eight men, the gang of eight? Yeah. The, um, and they were all men that were making the decisions that would affect women. And, and, and children. Uh, so early on, we decided to, to um, put a voice in there for women, and we continue to do. Right, I think, I mean, it's really interesting. I'm just now seeing the gender part of it, and because, like, even with, like, deportation cases, a lot of the community work, like, grassroots organizing work, where we have petitions to stop deportations, a lot of them are majority male immigrants. And now I'm just thinking where are the, I'm sure like both men and women are impacted by it, but we don't see a lot of women and mothers petition for deportation. I don't think, 
I don't know. It's just I'm now uh, just having like a mind blowing. <laughs> I just I just I just want to tell you how we started in 2010 when that law SB 1070 yeah. was passed in Arizona. Right. Um, we went out to Arizona because um, Ponte Movement reached out to us, which is an organization in Arizona, and they reached out to us uh, because women were being um, held in detention and their children were left alone. And we had children that were just crying in front of the camera who would come home from school and didn't see their mother and had to go to a neighbor and, and um, the mother was in detention for like three months before they, they let her out. And this um, was so outrageous to us that as a movement, um, we came back and we had we contacted every women rights organization I believe in the country, and we had over 75 people on a conference call, and people were very interested. What can we do? How can we help? And that's how we um, started the We Belong Together campaign, to stop the separation of families. Have you? Um, yeah. Well. Well, thank you all for having me here. This is a fantastic space that we can have. Um, so I've seen over in New York this surveillance services. You know, you see a stroller and you see a license plate that's, how's my nanny doing? Call this number, right? So I was wondering if that's something that the Alliance is addressing in any way, because surveillance is very present with the farm workers, right, and the working space. So is there are there any conversations that you know, happening around that? As an, um, as an uh, alliance, I don't, um, I don't think that we really took that up, um, mm -hmm. but maybe the local organizations in New York, um, I'm sure they have discussed it at their, um, their regular gatherings because most of them meet like once, twice a month. Um, and I'm sure that they um, discuss it um, among them their workers, to let the workers be aware, you know, uh, more aware of what's going on um, with the, the strollers and these cameras and, uh, and, and such like. It's, it, you know, it's actually very interesting when you think about it because, um, it, I, you know, I think it's a way to disempower workers even more, this idea that you have any kind of autonomy on your job, that perhaps you have a child who's acting out, right, and it kind of limits what a worker can do. I mean, we don't do that for parents, you know, but if, if a parent has a child who's acting out and the parent decides to raise their voice or act, you know, we, you know, we don't have little stickers on, the, on our, you know, stroller saying, how am I doing as a parent? And please Please call somebody. Child you, services. Child <laughs> services. I mean, you know, so it's so it's very interesting how that's been used, and I think in so many ways it really exposes domestic workers or nannies in particular to even more abuse and control. And and can I just tell you a, a, a small story about that? I work as a a domestic worker on the Upper West Side, and one afternoon I went in, and my boss said to me that. Um, a lady down the street had asked him, saw him after I left in the evening with a little girl, and he says, um, do you take care of her? He says, no, I have a nanny. She right. says, do you have a camera in your house? He said, no. <laughs> and she said, you must get a camera. <laughs> he said, he said I, don't need, I don't need a camera. I believe she loved my child more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for your work. And um, I'm wondering, um, was there any organized opposition in Albany to uh, over that that five year, five to six year period? Who, who opposed the, the the bill that was proposed? Interestingly enough, we never really had opposition in Albany. We had um, some um, members of in Albany that didn't um, vote for the bill, that re, you know, declined to, to vote for the bill, but there was not a, a set opposition that was against the bill. Because as I explained, we involve both um, workers 
and um, there were plenty employers that came forward through um, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice um, that hire domestic worker, that give testimony that I couldn't do it if I didn't have this domestic worker. Um, you know, this woman is taking care of my children for so many years. And then there were children who were um, had domestic workers as their nannies, and they were now college age. That talk about their um, their nanny and how much love um, you know they have for their nanny, and they they need rights, um, they need laws to protect their nannies. So, but it was not um, like uh, people that stand up and and oppose really the domestic workers bill. I really want to thank the panel for. No, a great panel, and I want to commend Matt and, and um, Labor Studies for putting together a really important symposium here. Barbara, I was on the bus with you all when we went to the Hamptons. Oh, and so <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I remember how effective that was. Yeah. So I'm thinking of what Pamela said about the shaming, and that's what we were thinking at the time. That yeah. this is how you really bring these late these um, employers to their knees. And so I like your point about, you know, the social movement organizing so we don't see it as the typical kind of standard labor organizing. And more that it's in the, rather than in centers of, of workplaces themselves, that you do it wherever the workers are, like in community. I want to ask you if you think, how effective you think that is and how, because it's like a long-term strategy that is sometimes very slow, but it is. Um, one that's, that, you know, many labor scholars like yourself see as so crucial. How effective do you think it is? And what do you think needs to happen now to really strengthen it or increase it as a real possibility of making this happen? Because, I asked the question because of this colleague's question about, you know, it being probably stymied in Massachusetts and other places because so many I mean in DC, Maryland, in Maryland and DC, because so many of the people on the Hill have those domestic workers. And those of us who've been in the organizing know who these employers are, from governors to so how effective do you think the shaming is? You talk, you want me to? Okay. Yeah. So um, I think that, I mean, when I use the term social movement unionism, I think part of what that implies is that you don't just have a constituency of a small group of people in a particular occupation, but it's really about building alliances. So when we think about domestic workers, we have to think about the alliances with farm workers, with restaurant workers, uh, with guest workers. And so the ways in which, I mean, we can call them all the excluded workers, right, the marginal workers, people who, who don't have the same kinds of labor rights. So I think social movement, and, and even people outside of labor, so civil rights organizations, or women's organizations. So the basis for me of social movement unionism is how can we build a broad-based movement uh, that is not catered to just one very small constituency. So I think that when we think about the effectiveness of that, I think in this moment in history, when the labor movement, what is it, you know, 6% of public sector workers and 12% of private, uh, I'm sorry, 12% of public sector workers, about 6% of private sector workers are unionized. I don't know if those are exactly right, but it's somewhere around there. In this moment, when our official union membership rate is so incredibly low, I think we have to ask what different models are there out there that we can use to really build a broad-based working class movement? So it's not just about union membership, but it's about labor organizing. And in that sense, I think this movement has been enormously successful. I mean, if we look at the trajectory of the mainstream labor movement, I mean, they had their peak in the 1930s, but have been declining ever since. And I think this is the wave of the future. This model is the wave of the future. And I think it holds tremendous promise in terms of that. I agree, but I think that I agree entirely with that position, and I do think that social organizing is the way to go. But I think that in some sectors, you know, like domestic workers, it's small, per se, compared to what we're trying to do at the broad-based building. But one effective tool has been the shaming. Oh, mm -hmm. And so I just want to know if that has a place in social union 
I mean, in social movement? Or a absolutely, because I think that's what, um, I mean, that's what social movements have done so effectively from the civil rights movement forward, is this idea of attempting to raise public consciousness and public awareness. So it's about shaming individuals, but it's also about putting everybody else on notice who might be doing this, who's not being shamed at that moment, that this is wrong, that, that there is, in fact, a moral standard that we ought to live by. So I think that's where the shaming is most effective, is not just in terms of that individual, but about public awareness um, around a particular issue. Can I just add yeah, something? Yeah, sure. So, I, you know, this is a really interesting question, this sort of social movement unionism, and, and really the, the successes that you've had uh, in, encourage questions about, well, what does it mean if you do get labor rights and collective organizing rights? Well, what does bargaining look like for domestic workers, right? So, you know, who's in, in labor law talk, there's a bargaining unit, right? And they bargain with the employers. But, you know, is there a way to sort of have a more of a group or cooperative kind of bargaining structure with multiple employers? And our you know, our labor law systems really build on industrial, sort of the assumptions of the industrial workplace, and domestic work is, looks very different. Um, and so, you know, part of part of the thinking and, and um, domestic workers are, are doing this is, well, how can we have legal models that support what, what, what work for us and, and not lose what <laughs> some of the innovations that we've come up with? Yeah, but the end then, uh, sorry. Uh, let me I'll add to that. Um, if, and if we look at the labor movement over the years, as Pramil was saying, the decline in the labor movement, and not only the decline in the labor, labor movement, but they, um, the take back that, um, that um, employers want to give to the labor movement, the gains that they have had in, in, in the years are being taken back one after the other. And um, I think, like, Occupy Wall Street come out and bring a lot of um, pressure on um, the on the whole society to come out and give the voice to to um, the wrongs and the ills in society and um, social movements. Um, you know, um, it it is not the the norm per se, but um, it might be the way to the, to the future. Okay, we probably only have time for one more, and Kathy's been trained. Yeah, I'm, uh, to know, to follow up on the previous question about opposition and to what extent and how, maybe now historically, have the employers been mobilizing against workers seeking these rights? Because it's a very curious workplace from the standpoint of the worker, but also from the employer, because they're not entering a supportive relationship for a direct profit. So they would have to be mobilizing in a very personal capacity, um, which raises a lot of sort of moral outcry, basically. So I'm just interested to know, I mean, how do their opposition movements look? How do they organize, and how effective have they been? Uh, as I was saying before, we didn't have, like, um, people who came out in opposition, but I'm, I'm happy to, to say that during the, um, in our small city bill, there was one agency that was um, in opposition to it. In the broader um, state bill, there was no um, organized opposition. And coming out of that, because of the broad coalition that we built with um, employers, the hand in hand, the domestic worker employer was formed. So now there is a movement of employers that are working, um, you know, and they're saying, give fair wages to the people you hire. Because hand in hand is a domestic worker employer agency, not the worker, the uh, employer, yeah, agency. And they're now um, not only local to New York, but they're also in California. You know, if I could just say historically, you know, Employers, I think, are concerned about two things. One is having a reliable workforce, historically, and 
cheap labor, <laughs> right? And so, and, and I think at different moments in history, employers have formed reform organizations for these purposes, and sometimes that has meant bringing in immigrant workers, contract laborers in the 1940s. We actually had a program of contract laborers uh, from Puerto Rico, so Puerto Rican women could work as domestic workers here in the U.S. Um, so that's been one strategy, but I think at other moments in time, employers did believe you have to raise wages and raise standards in order to have a more reliable workforce. So I think you know there there are sort of competing strategies about how employers go about this. In the 1970s, um, as Kate knows as well, uh, domestic workers and employers actually worked together to pass the Fair Labor Standards Act amendment uh, because many employers did see it in their interest to bring domestic work under minimum wage. Uh, protection. Okay. The real last question I want to give Catherine. Oh, aren't you nice? <laughs> um, I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a legal question in the sense that I'm hearing that you didn't face organized opposition and you're using a kind of state-by-state -state strategy, which takes a long time. And in some states that probably don't have a tradition of doing this for domestic labor, and I'm stereotyping the South, so excuse me, Southerners are for doing that. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, given this president, uh, given that there doesn't seem to be organized opposition, why isn't there a, a, a strong federal campaign? Well, maybe Barbara. Uh, it's what, what happened when we were looking at first at organizing um, state to state, um, we, you have to I think the strategy was you have to pass a law in the state because federal, um, federal. If you go to federal law, um, you have to pass state law before you can pass federal law. That this is the way how how the system worked. We couldn't go straight to the the federal government because then um, it would mean you bypass the state any state law. And then the state would got a, a, a right to come and, and, and set standards in their state for how they want to, to work. But the, the problem is, um, one of the problems I should say that we had before was with the, um, the care workers, the companion, uh, the workers who were deemed as companions. Um, living workers working and taking care of the elderly, and these people were working for like just two dollars, um, three dollars an hour. And um, this was one of the campaigns that we work with the Department of Labor and the president, and he just removed that regulation that bar those workers from getting minimum wage or overtime. And um, so this was like a huge victory because now over probably 2.5 million um, care workers are eligible to receive these um, benefits from and this regulation. Laws, a lot of state labor law. I come from public sector labor, and the only reason there was the right was because of the Fed. So it seems like some of the big changes have happened at the federal level, and the states have been forced to do it. But again. Or yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, certainly, and, and it depends on which states you're talking about, right? But um, but many labor and employment rights were seen first in progressive states and then the, the federal law fall. But there's not a legal requirement that it go in, in that direction or another. So it's, it's a little bit more of a political question. Something like changing Title VII of the Civil Rights Act to, you know, to change its 15 employee limit to one, that's going to be a big fight because it's going to change a lot of not just you know for domestic workers, but other kinds of uh, workplaces. So so you know in some ways it may be easier to do it state by state and just for domestic workers. Um, there is a little bit of a legal question about you know whether the federal government can step in because it's just in one employee kind of workplaces. So you might get into that legal question at the federal level, and you can avoid it by first going through the states and, and getting those rights there. But, but it's a little bit more of a strategic question. It's not a legal requirement to go to the states first. Okay. 
I, you know, I also think one other critical issue in terms of the Bill of Rights that have been passed is the question of enforcement. You know, and I think part of the reason there isn't this kind of opposition is because people feel like there there aren't any real enforcement mechanisms. So I think they're very, very important victories symbolically. You know, I think we have to recognize that. Uh, but uh, it's still a really imbalanced relationship in terms of power, and employers still have a tremendous amount of power. Um, and I think that shaped, you know, how the Bill of Rights has been received. All right, we're going to have to cut it off there. Thank you so much to the panel.